right? As folks are trickling in, heads up to everyone that uh, the chat settings should be on. So you should be able to introduce yourself, say hi, where you're dialing in from, and we will get started in just a few seconds once everyone's in. Well, Budapest, Portland, Colombia, all over the place. I love seeing where everyone's from. It's so cool. Yeah. Pennsylvania. UK, San Diego, Kerala. Wow. Stockholm. Oh, in Toronto, Medellin. <laughs> Mexico City, Cape Town. Whoa. This is a in Dakar. Wow. So many, so many Malaysia, different. Malaysia, London, Guatemala. Oh my God. It's coming in wow. so fast. We do need a map. Latvia everywhere, all over the place. Awesome. Well, we're so glad that you all are joining us this morning. Um, we have a topic that clearly resonated with lots of folks. People have been asking um, us at Pinecone, you know, they've been asking Matthew, they've been asking um, all over the internet about uh, what you can do to make a really robust pipeline for ingesting PDFs for RAG. And so we're really excited to host Matthew Berman and, and James to talk through uh, best practices for all this. So. I'm here from Pinecone to just uh, make sure that everything is running smoothly on the Zoom side. My name is Bear. So when you all have questions, please drop them into the Q&A section. The chat is for communicating and you can ask questions if you think you're going to ask them with fellow attendees. I'll be monitoring that as well if there's anything we can help with in the interim. But otherwise, funnel anything that you want to ask our presenters directly through the Q&A section and they'll have some time for questions at the end. So with that, I am going to disappear and kick it off, hand it over to James. Yeah, cool. Um, actually, I just very quickly, first title slide here um, on making PDFs RAG ready. Um, so Matt's going to jump into a lot of interesting stuff first, and then we're going to go through um, some more stuff on like PDFs, how we process entering them, all that sort of stuff, um, and also a couple of other file types as well. Um, but yeah, very quick, I'll pass it over to Matt. Thank you, James. Uh, hey, everybody from all over the world. That is so cool. Uh, I'm not going to get into the technical bits. I'm going to save that for, for James. He is so knowledgeable about it. So I'm, I'm definitely excited to hear uh, really the details uh, in the weeds techniques to get the most out of RAG. But I, I want to talk for a second about the kind of more hand wavy, high level uh, if, like ways that you can think about RAG and specifically what use cases uh, are. And then I also want to talk about one that I've only been thinking about for a couple of weeks now, but I think is incredibly important. So first, why do you use RAG? Uh, I get a lot of companies coming to me asking me, uh, how do I give my LLM external knowledge? Uh, and, and, like a number of other use cases as well. And a lot of people start with, well, I need to fine tune the model. Uh, nine times out of 10, the answer is actually RAG. Uh, it, very few times do you actually need to fine tune a model. And the, the kind of the, the main reason why you are going to use RAG is to give additional knowledge to the model. So any type of external knowledge within the context of running a company or being a part of a company, if you want to give the model uh, internal information about how your company operates, about uh, you know a knowledge base, um, about any topic that it doesn't already know about, private information uh, uh, about your company that is not public on the web and it couldn't have been trained on, RAG is really good for that. It's also good for additional context, which is kind of one in the same. So as you want uh, your your model to start behaving in a certain way and knowing things about you personally, your company, uh, how you operate, how you do things, giving it additional knowledge and excuse me, additional context is going to be done through RAG, right? You don't want to 
put all of that knowledge into every single prompt. Likely it won't fit. And even if it could, you probably don't want to. You want the the context that is most relevant for the prompt that you're giving. And that pipeline is so incredibly important. And that's what James is really going to explain in detail. Another really cool use case, which is really just an extension of the first two bullet points on this slide, uh, is code bases. So if you're doing... Uh, if you're using AI to help you code, uh, you, typically you cannot fit an entire code base into a context window. Uh, even the largest context windows are a million tokens. Sometimes I think, you know, occasionally it's 2 million, but even then it doesn't work incredibly well. So uh, if you have a, a decently large code base and you want to actually use AI to code and, and give it the understanding of your code base and how different files relate to each other, how different methods relate to each other. Uh, RAG is really, uh, really great at that. Um, and then memory, which is maybe, you know, a form of uh, additional context, but especially if you're building both a personal um, AI system or, or even a business AI system, you want it to learn about you because you want it to you want to develop almost like a shorthand. Uh, when you're working with your AI, you don't want to have to explain everything every single time. The simplest way to do that is through a system message, but system messages are are limited in in context length. So, as you're interacting for days, weeks, years with an AI, you want it to learn about you. Uh, you want to you wanted to learn about your business, and that is, again, what Rag is incredibly valuable for. And on this notion of memory, uh, James, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, I really want to talk about this thing that I've been thinking about a lot lately, which is agents. I mean, if you've watched any of my videos, you know that I I absolutely love agents, bullish on agents, right? Um, and I've been thinking about it. If you're a company and you're onboarding an agent. Let's just start with one. It's pretty much a vanilla large language model. Maybe you have a, a nice framework around it. Uh, you can give it memory or it has memory. It can use tools. It has tools. Uh, but you're basically starting from scratch. And it's quite analogous to onboarding a human employee where if you don't give them any information about how your business operates, if you don't give them any information about um, the the context of your business, uh, any internal documentation, that person starts from nothing and they either have to ask a ton of questions to get ramped up or you just have to explain every single thing in detail. Uh, and you know, over time, you do develop that shorthand that I just mentioned. You develop a shorthand uh, dialogue or with a, a, a human uh, employee or colleague. Well, you can kind of think about it the same way with agents. Uh, you you onboard an agent, and if it has no information, you even if it has memory, it takes time to develop that shorthand. It takes time for the agent to learn about you. So I've been thinking about this thing that you should probably do, which requires RAG, which is almost like give it an onboarding document. And this document is not just a single um uh, you know, a single page or a couple pages of natural language. It could be anything. Uh, it could be internal Excel files. It could be PDFs. It can be just a pre a pre written list of prompts that you expect to give it in the future. Um, but the point is, you really want to reduce the time it takes to onboard agents. And we've, you know, we're talking about a single agent. So if you're onboarding an agent and you can feed it this. Um, the set of information, the set of external knowledge or context. And then all of a sudden that agent can be useful and valuable from day one. That uh, that shortcutting of the onboarding process is quite valuable. Um, and so like, I, I just think people should start thinking about that as business owners or, or employees at a company. How do I onboard an agent in the quickest way possible? And so you can write out entire onboarding docs for agents, just like you would for human employees or colleagues. 
And so, yeah, I've been thinking a lot about that. And especially if you want to scale up to not just hiring one agent, but dozens, hundreds, thousands, millions of agents, um, that ability to scale the onboarding effort is going to be incredibly important. Um, and yeah, so I've just been thinking a lot about that. I'm trying to figure out what that structure looks like of the onboarding document. It's probably some combination of access to internal databases, uh, maybe even employee uh, onboarding guides, HR practices. Uh, it's probably a bunch of different things. And a lot of this can and should be converted into a RAG pipeline. Um, so I, I just, I love this notion as more agents join the workforce, being able to have them ready to go and have that shorthand developed from minute one is very, very interesting to me. Uh, and so I'm excited uh, to pass it to James and learn about how we can actually do that. So yeah, that's a little bit about agent onboarding um, and definitely something I'm going to think about more. Cool. Thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, so super interesting use case. And I think gives us a lot to think about. Um, of course, like when you are onboarding, you know, whether that's people, agents, whatever it is, a lot of the time, the process for that tends to be, okay, like read all of these documents, consume all this information. And as far as I know, I could be wrong here, but as far as I know, the sort of most common file type that you're going to get in, in most corporations is PDFs. So for what I want to talk about is a little bit of how I would approach in terms of a mental framework for processing PDFs, but not just PDFs, because this can actually apply to anything. So you can see at the start here, I'm like final file processing, not PDF processing, because this does really apply to almost any you know file type um, out there. So very high level, these are kind of like the four steps I would think about. Um, there are more and you could definitely break this up more, you could group, group this up more, um, but I like to break it down like this. So for, for PDF specifically, file processing is just like an insanely complicated thing to do. Um, if uh, well, the ones of you that have worked with processing PDFs know what I'm talking about. The ones of you that don't probably don't believe me. But PDFs are like the most uh, incredibly frustrating file type to actually work with. So, um, I mean, they look really good. They display really well. But like the, the code, the encoding behind them is just like insane. and doesn't make any sense. Um, so it's very hard to process them well. Uh, but there are actually, with recent AI models, computer vision models, that is actually getting a lot easier. Um, but it's a hard file to process. Um, we'll talk about that more in a moment. There is also organizing the structure of our documents, right? So, so PDFs especially, there's generally, depending on the PDF, and we'll get a couple of examples in a moment, there will be some structure to that PDF. Right. And okay, and why do we even have structure in PDFs? It's obviously to organize everything or organize the information within that for you know, humans. Uh, but generally, I, I like to think, you know, when we are providing information to agents, the way that we should do so is in a way that is friendly to humans as well, because they've been trained on the human language. So they kind of, you know, they that structure, it works for us. And in most cases, it's going to work well for agents as well. So Structure is very good uh, if we can maintain it and sort of keep it. Um, and, and of course, we also need this when we're looking at, okay, how do we handle tables, images, figures, you know, all this sort of stuff. Uh, then we have trunking. There's like a million things to talk about trunking. Um, we'll talk more about that later. And also augmentation. Um, again, that's like, okay, once you have your trunks, maybe there's, additional things you can add to them to improve the retrieval later on when it comes to that RAG. So that is the pipeline at high level. We'll jump into it in a bit more detail very soon. Okay, cool. 
So when it comes to the file processing part, there are a few important things to um, be aware of, right? So when it comes to PDFs, scanned or digital, like they're, they're going to be completely different, right? When you think about uh, like the more traditional file processing techniques, if you're looking at digital documents, they're going to go into the code behind the PDF and try and extract things out and parse that. Uh, if you've scanned that PDF, there, there is no like underlying code. It's, it's like an image and it's been you know, compressed into your, into your PDF format. Uh, so at that point, you need to be looking at uh, OCR, so optical character recognition, or computer vision models, uh, some of which are doing really well right now. And we'll, we'll have a look at some of those. Um, another thing is, is the structure important? Again, we'll see an example of this in a moment. Um, and, and do those PDFs contain images, right? So like think research paper versus comic book, right? Completely different. Um, then, you know, not when, just, no, I don't want to just talk about PDFs. There's also other things. So video, for example, um, when we're looking at videos is what what information is important in the video for us, right? If you're looking at um, something, you know, like some like arty video where they're showing you all these landscapes and cityscapes, you know, whatever else, the speech of that video is probably not important and you probably want to focus on the images within that video. Whereas if you're looking at podcasts, of course, it's probably mostly the speech that you're going to be looking at. So you're going to process them in completely different ways. So these are all things that you need to be considering when you're looking at how do I go ahead and you know, start processing my, um, my files. So this is an example. Um, so on, on the left, I, when it comes to processing PDF documents, if I'm going to build a system, what I do every single time is, okay, I'm just going to go get some AI archive papers. I'm going to you know, test it on that. And, you know, I'm going to get that to work really, really well, um, because that's just you know that's what I'm what I think about. But then you know you build that out, and then someone will come to you with the thing on the right, so the this <laughs> Iron Man comic, and there is no way what you built for your archive papers is going to work on your Iron Man comic, right? You need like a completely different um, way of processing documents there. So you need to really try and understand what sort of documents you are processing and build that because the approach is just going to be completely different. Um, so just as a brief, like a, what would I do with these? Uh, the one on the left, tension is all you need. I would probably usually go for the more traditional techniques, um, assuming it isn't scanned. I wouldn't bother necessarily with OCR, you could try it, but honestly, sometimes it, it works worse than just the traditional techniques and computer vision models, except for maybe images or tables in there, I wouldn't use at all. Uh, whereas on the right, of course, it's just like OCR, computer vision models, that is the way to go. So very, uh, yeah, very different approaches, depending on what you, what you're working with. Cool. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, actually, this is kind of just what I, I covered a minute ago. So, video, spoken audio, that's the sort of pipeline you might want to work uh, work with. So, you'd go MP4, extract out the MP3, then using a speech to text model, and you go into your tracking and whatever else. Um, whereas, if it's image focused, you need to be extracting those images. Uh, you really interesting here. Um, I, there is an example linked in this in these slides. But I'm not going. I don't think we'll have time to go through it. But you can apply the semantic chunking methods that you would use with uh, text also to video. So you extract out the images. You identify where there are all of a sudden like um, changes within the embeddings of your images as they go, and that gives you a chunk in the video. And you can you can apply that, and it works really well. Um, like the, the you you will see an object from two different directions, and the using this methodology, it will be able to identify that those two are actually the same topic, so it will not split those two different scenes. And then when it changes to another topic within your video, uh, it will you know, split right there. 
So that's already a cool technique uh, for getting like good chunks within videos. And then you can also use um, vision-based LLMs to basically convert your images over time into text, which you can then you know, go and encode and search through. Okay, the structure of everything. We do have a we have an example in a moment, so we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, so with your data processing pipeline, uh, the structure part is pretty important, right? As I mentioned, PDFs you have you know all those different structure elements at the top there, headers, paragraphs, stuff, and so on. Then you think about tables and images or figures and we'll see a, a figure example in a moment um so with both of those you're going to need to do something different to what you do with text right you, i mean okay tables you could encode but when you're searching for information from a table if you just have like the elements within the table it's, it's generally quite abstract and you kind of need in most cases a almost summary of the table as a whole in order for that context to make sense. So what you would usually do or the sort of standard uh, approach to handling table is, is you take your table, you process it, put it into markdown or something that an LLM can easily read and then ask the LLM to either give you a summary or in some cases it might be worth multiple summaries and just embedding each of those and linking them back to the video so that later on, depending on what your query is, you can link that to the video, bring that, uh, link that to the, sorry, the table, bring that table data back and feed it into your downstream application, whether that's like a, um, like an agent, LLM, or something else, like you're doing calculations over a table or, or whatever else. So yeah, you're handling those in a different way. Uh, and then for the images that will, We'll see an example in just a second, so I won't uh, won't ruin that surprise. So let's have a quick look at yeah time. Let's have a quick look at this example, just so I can give you an understanding of uh, what I'm talking about in terms of code when we're looking at the sort of structure of PDFs. All right. So this is you'll be able to get a link to this uh, if you'd like to go through it. This is using the structured. And we're actually taking that attention to all you need paper, right? And you can see here, this is one important thing, right? Here, you have your strategy, right? I just put fast. Fast is like the traditional approach. You could use high res, and that will use OCR, it will use computer vision model. That's like, you know, that's like all the bells and whistles. But with this paper, Honestly, I I was getting I get much better results from using this traditional fast method than using the fancy OCR computer vision method. And the difference is that when you're running this fast method, it's you know you're waiting maybe a second. If you're running the OCR um, computer vision method, I, I'm running on CPU, so maybe it's film fair, but you're you're still waiting like maybe a minute, maybe longer. It takes a long time. Right, so you're you're just wasting compute and time um, on something fancier that honestly gets you worse results. But anyway, so with unstructured, I think they're really a very good example of a library that handles the structure of PDFs quite nicely. So we can see we process stuff, we get text, uh, this narrative text, they're basically the same thing. Uh, titles, which are kind of more like headers in a lot of these cases, um, but PDFs are hard to handle. To deal with, so it's not perfect. Uh, and then, yeah, you can see um, title, text, footer, so on and so on, right? So we have all these different um, elements, and we can also get tables and uh, figures out of this as well, uh, which is great because, of course, we need to process them differently, right? So we can build our logic around the elements that the instruction gives us here. And then, if we just take a look at, you know, what the you know the plain text of what we're getting here uh, we can see this right so one thing we can do here immediately is we can consider the structure when we're actually building our chunks later right so uh, we have for example here we, we have encoder it's telling us about the encoder 
um, and then here it's telling us about the decoder. Or later on again, uh, here it's telling us about the weights assigned to each value, so on and so on. Um, but maybe when we're taking a chunk out of this, there's almost like a lack of context, right? So if I just gave you a random paragraph on a research paper uh, without any context, you know, where that's from or, or whatever else, I think most most would be pretty confused and, and not really understand what is going on. We need a bit of context around that. So one thing that I tend to, that I, I like to do and I, I tend to see a lot of others do is just add additional context. So this is more the augmentation step in the pipeline. Um, but you simply add, okay, what document is this coming from? We add the header. So here we're talking about the model architecture. And then we have, okay, most competitive uh, neural sequence transduction models, so on and so on. All right, so this would be our, our chunk. We haven't really done chunking here, but this is just an example. So it's um, just a way of adding more, more context to your chunks based on the structure of of your PDFs. So, yeah, just a quick example there. Um, I, you know, if you're just getting started with this and you want to like start considering like the structure of your PDFs and structure is a is a pretty pretty good place to start. And then of course, um, with that we can extract the tables. I already described how we might handle that. And then we can also extract images, right? So images are interesting because they are generally quite hard to handle and they have been for a long time, right? So let's say we have this image. Um, like this is an image that there isn't text data contained within the PDF or embedded within the, in the PDF. And I mean, how, how do you even, like, what do you do to describe this? Up until probably uh, you know, this year, I think, this was, very, I would say, either very difficult or basically impossible. Uh, now it's actually pretty doable, thanks to a lot of the uh, recent computer vision um, and uh, vision language, or sorry, multimodal models that have been released. So this is using uh, Pixel. Uh, I, I, this might be zoomed out a little bit, so I can I can just open this. So I simply asked it, uh, or I gave it this little prompt here, explain what this figure shows. I fed in this image, and then the model output is actually super detailed. So you can see here, there's this, like a ton of detail, and it's, uh, it's you know, accurate and very, like it, it details everything there. All right, so we just solved that problem of, okay, how do we handle images? Well, we just translate them to text with, one of these models, which is not really not that hard to do, um, at least not now. That you know, not that long ago, that was practically impossible. But we can do that super easily now. So that is very cool. And of course, as you can see here, this is working with a figure like like a chart, and they are generally also harder to to handle because you have you have an image that it's rel it's pretty abstract and you have all these different data points on it, it's hard to capture all that information. Um, it's not perfect, I will say, but much better than it has been um, in at least, the, at least recently. Cool. Um, okay, okay. So that is our sort of the, the structure part of it and how we might handle different like structural components within our PDFs. Then we also have the chunking component. So chunking, I think, gets talked about a fair bit more than the other parts. Uh, and maybe with good reason, there's, there is a lot to talk about here. Or there's, there's a lot of different methods, and maybe it's a bit more fun to talk about. Uh, so it's more visual, maybe. Maybe that's what it is. So yes, there are many different chunking methods. Uh, like high level what you're going to be looking at is like a, a super naive approach where you're just looking at tokens, like, okay, 300 tokens, let's make a split. Uh, generally, probably would not recommend that, but you can do it. Uh, probably the next step up from that is using characters to decide where those splits are. This is actually, it's simple, kind of, it's kind of like a, a dumb method, but it works really well, honestly. Um, 
in a lot of cases you don't okay in some cases you do need, need do need more than this it really depends on how hard your sort of search um how hard the search problem is we'll, we'll talk more about that in a moment uh, then there is the trunking within the extracted structure that can kind of be tied to all the other trunking methods as well. So it's basically just, okay, considering the extracted structure, uh, we probably don't want to be, you know, having chunks that span multiple sections with an PDF. Uh, that, that's, all, that's all. We then have semantic trunking. There's a lot to talk about that, but essentially high level think embeddings and using those embeddings to decide where your chunks should be. Or, or chunking based on semantic meaning is, is maybe a simpler way of putting it. And then LLM-based chunking, uh, which I know I know a fair few people like to do this. I honestly, I it's fine, but probably super expensive and over the top for most use cases, in my opinion. Um, but I mean, yeah, you can try it, right? Cool. Okay, so considerations when we're chunking, um, mainly talking about text here. So we want to consider uh, the input data, right? So if you have a structured PDF, you're probably going to treat it differently to a like an open dialogue um, audio or text extracted from a like a podcast, right? Uh, the reason for that is, of course, a PDF is just more structured. So by chunking based on structure, you're probably going to get more like sensical information from that. Whereas if you try and chunk based on structure, uh, this webinar and me just kind of talking and, and rambling, you, you the results are probably not going to be that great. Instead, what you would want to do is um, more like semantic chunking, where you are allowing an embedding model and some uh, logic to decide, okay, he, he was talking about uh, PDFs and how we process them a moment ago. Now he's talking about chunking and chunking videos. Okay, there's, there's kind of a split there, so we can make that split. So depending on what your input data looks like, you're going to want to use kind of completely different methods in some cases. Um, and then also some cases, so th there was there was one document um, that I had a while back where we, okay, we had all like, you know, fancy chunking methods, uh, semantic, recursive, you know, structure-based, whatever else. Um, but then we had one document which just didn't work with any of them. And the reason it didn't work with any of them is because someone had kind of built this document to be easily processable by hey, uh, machines, right? So they've, they've set this up so that it should be easier for us. But by trying to set it up to make it easier for us, they've make it, made it just like not like any other normal document. Uh, so what, what they've done is put like the three dashes in between every sort of entry within that document. Um, and, and, and that was it. So that kind of like messed up the whole, um, you know, chunking methodology that 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 we had for you know all of these other use cases, um, yeah, all these other sort of edge cases. So in that case, actually, just something super super naive, uh, which is just splitting on delimiters processed from your documents. Right. In some cases, you might even end up doing that. Uh, again, it varies. It just depends on it depends on the sort of space that you're in and, and what sort of documents you're working with. Um, yeah, so there is that. Search is another big part, right? So again, I um, had a similar issue, similar issue in the past where uh, we built very, like a, a great sort of semantic search uh, chunking pipeline, right? Which it, it you know, worked super well, made, Make these like great chunks for your like the, these many like hundreds of thousands of, of PDF documents, and the problem that we came into with that is semantic chunking is expensive, right? Because you're you're creating embeddings for all these little components within 
uh, within documents and then deciding whether to based on those embeddings that you create, you, you're paying for those embeddings. So semantic chunking is cost like financially expensive and also computationally, or not computationally, but time expensive uh, because you've got to go you know, send your embedding request, receive it, you know, so on and so on. You're going to be waiting a while. So it doesn't scale. Well, it scales, but it depends on how much throughput you need. Um, and, and this one scenario, the throughput was pretty important. What we ended up um, realizing is that we had information within, like logical information that we could pull in and decide, actually, we don't need to search through this entire search space of like hundreds of thousands of documents. Instead, we can filter the search space to just one or two documents every single time. So all of a sudden your search scope is far smaller and that makes the search problem far, far easier to, to do, right? Your, your search, when you're searching across a mil, like hundreds of thousands of documents or millions of documents or, or chunks, search is just inherently harder compared to if you're searching across a thousand or 10,000 chunks where it becomes incredibly easy, uh, generally, usually incredibly easy. So in this case, where semantic chunking can give you very high quality embeddings, uh, you just actually, you don't need it because the, the search problem is not hard. So you can just go with like a, a, dumb, um, a dumb chunking method like a uh, recursive character splitter from Langchain or you know one of these more sort of traditional, not, not traditional, that's a, that's a bad word, uh, one of these simpler um, trunking methods. So that's another thing that needs to be considered all the time. And then also the, the output format is, it can be important, probably less so than the other two, um, but basically output uh, when you're feeding things into an LM, you don't want to feed too much information to the LM. So, more a case of trying to keep your chunks relatively concise. Um, but in most cases, you are also going to want to do that to create good embeddings. So that should already be handled by you know, your previous sort of uh, limitations or, or steps. Cool. OK, so that's chunking. And we had, uh, cool, uh, great. Um, one, OK, this is, I think, a good example. I, I do want to show you this one because I think it's cool. So this is chunking videos using basically what I just talked about, what I just spoke about, but for text, right? So you're using embeddings to chunk videos. Um, the one thing that's different is rather than, uh, of course, taking text and creating text embeddings, you're you're taking images out of your video and creating image embeddings. So in this video, what do we have? We have like this, uh, this is an okay example. I'm gonna keep going because there's another example here. So we have this video where there's, uh, the colors are messed up in the, the visual here. Uh, but we have this guy who's like going through, I find the actual link for it in a minute, this one. Last year, the smoking tire went on the Bull Run Live Rally. Okay, so this is the video, right? You can see there's like different scenes here. Like there's a guy in a car, he's switching over to his like pickup truck on the road. There's this where there's all of these, um, I don't know, cars or whatever. There's multiple like scenes within this video that you can split on, right? And depending on how, depending on like, how strict or, or loose you want that to be, you can uh, modify your, your threshold to adjust for you know, different sort of, hey, will these scenes be together? Will you split them up more? Uh, it varies, right? So you can see if we come down here, we have those sort of splits. So on each row here, we have a chunk that has been created. Uh, on In the first image of the row, you have like the first like scene or first image from that chunk. Then we have a image taken from the middle of the chunk, and then we have an image taken from the end of the chunk. And you can see that these are actually pretty accurate. So even, even here, right? So this mm, like chunk that we have in the middle, 
the start of the trunk, you have the pickup truck from like front. Um, it, it's a very different scene, but then it kind of sweeps around. You have the pickup truck from the side. It's a very different scene. And then it goes um, to the back of the pickup truck. Again, completely different in terms of like the image similarity. If you're just looking at pixels, they're very different, but the topic is the same. You have the, the pickup truck driving on the road. Um, and it manages to identify that. And then we, you know, split again, and you can see, okay, it's identifying this guy, and it you know keeps on going, and it's pretty good at identifying these actual like image-based chunks from within a video, which is pretty cool. And this is using, I, I'm not not kidding, like exactly the same sort of chunking methodology or concept that we would use with text from PDFs, um, for, for semantic chunking at least, which I think it is pretty cool. Cool. Okay. So that's chunking. Uh, then we have the uh, sort of the, kind of the last step. There's other things you can add in there, but I think this is a main last step. And we already kind of covered this already. So how do you augment your chunks? Okay. The first one we, we looked at already, right? So prefixing, document names, headers to your chunks. Uh, that can be, I, I would just generally, if you're working with PDFs, I would just generally do that as a, basically all the time, like as a, okay, test it, of course, but in most cases, my assumption is that this is going to help. Um, the other thing is just adding metadata. And so when I say adding metadata, I mean, not within the trunk itself that you're embedding, but adding metadata uh, that can then be passed to your, M or, or attached to your embeddings uh, downstream. So I, I mentioned earlier that was, there was an example where we found that we, okay, we could actually filter for documents or filter for one or two documents for every search query. That wouldn't have been possible if we didn't add metadata to those chunks. Um, the metadata in that case, like document IDs, uh, but there's other metadata you can add as well, right? Different tags for different things. Um, in, in some cases, you may or you even want to automate that sort of thing. Um, for example, if you want to extract entities, like named entities from a text, you can do that. You can put in your metadata or filter based on things uh, like that as well. And then this is a more recent one. So Anthropic uh, recently shared a paper on contextual retrieval. And part of that is kind of interesting concept of, um, so rather than, you know, kind of like how we are adding context to our chunks by prefixing document names or, or headers and stuff, uh, they actually do it with an LLM, and this LLM reads the, the full document, takes a look at your chunk, and then basically contextualizes that chunk within the wider document by you know, re rewriting it in some way. Uh, and then you embed that contextualized chunk. Uh, so that, that's, I, I, I haven't personally tried that yet, but I think that does seem like a pretty, uh, at least interesting approach, and I would imagine it will, it will work well as well. So that's definitely interesting. Cool. Anything else? So, yeah, I think I think that is high level. That's most of the input pipeline. Um, so just to finish, I do want to say that there is more to rag than just the input pipeline. Of course, I, I'm pretty sure most of you um, already assume that anyway. Um, we have... Actually, I'm just going to the next slide. We, of course, have our agents, right? So agents are a big part of this all the time. Um, whether that's your prompting, your sort of the construction with tools, um, that they are important, just deciding when to actually use RAG um, if, if you're using that agent structure. There is ways that you can build better queries, right? One that might come from your prompting for your for your LLM uh, agent. Uh, you have query decomposition or expansion, two other methods that you can use. Embeddings also super important. Uh, I I would say I don't want to go too much into that, but hybrid search is generally again it's one of those things where I just go in and I would assume that's probably going to make things better. Uh, so hybrid search with basically dense embeddings like you know opening eyes embedding models plus a sparse embedding, embedding model like the M25 works really well. And then post retrieval. Uh, so you can 
for example, add more context to your chunks by like kind of surrounding it with the chunks that it was originally with after you've retrieved it, uh, or re-ranking. And re-ranking, again, it's one of those, like another one of those essential things that I would just say will always make things better in most cases. Yeah, most of the time. So yeah, all, all of those super important. And I think putting all of those together is really how you build out a good, uh, you know, once you've built out your your good uh, input pipeline for your chunks, how you also just build good agents in general, but specifically agents that are using RAG. So that is it for the slides. I think what we can do is move on to questions. Yeah, we have a handful of really good questions in the Q and A. Cool. All right, let's let's go through them. Do then. you want, uh, James? Do you want me to read them off and you uh, you take a stab at them? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, let's see. If I click answer live. Okay. Um, so Spurthy Talum, hopefully I'm pronouncing your name right, has a good question about rag within. Uh, the use case of of chatbots. So Spurthy says, I'm curious how RAG could potentially fit into a chatbot application where we have follow-up questions which don't really have key information that's useful for retrieval. How can we supply or keep track of relevant context information to LLMs in this case? So I think... What Spurthy is saying is you're you're having a conversation, but there's maybe not really like uh, predefined key pieces of information to store, and and how do you do it? Does that make sense, James? Yeah, yeah. I think I think this is um this is like a typical problem that you see when you go with uh. So I always called it naive rag. I don't know what the actual name is for it, um. But the idea is that you would have you kind of have different types of rag or i mean there, there are so many different types now that 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 statement is kind of outdated back then i used to think of rag as fitting into almost like these three little three categories the first one which is the simplest and it's kind of the one that everyone got started with is you're basically performing rag with every query so you have like your you you have your chat uh the user asks a question and you're basically passing that question directly to your RAG search pipeline. Like you're encoding it, searching, and returning what you know relevant information is is provided. Um, then you have agentic RAG, which is where you're using your LLM to rewrite the query, right? And I think this is where you would find the solution to the problem that you're seeing here, which is. Okay, you have your chat history, so you can, I don't know, let's say someone is, they're talking about, they're talking about Rome, right? They're going to Rome, they're going for a vacation or whatever. Um, and then, you know, they've been talking for a little while about this. And then like, um, where should I find a good pizzeria, right? And the if, if you go naive rag, right, the query that's going to go to your rag engine is where do I find a good pizzeria? There's no context, right? It's like, oh, we're talking about Rome here. We're not talking about like everywhere in the world. Um, so what a, like what the agentic rag approach will do is the LLM is looking at your chat history, right? So it knows you're talking about Rome. You hopefully have prompted it to say, provide as much context in your query as possible based on previous methods if there is relevant context and the user's current query, right? You say something like that, and your LLM will hopefully, if it's good, if it's good LLM, uh, rewrite the query based on the context of your chat, based on the user's current query, and like put all of that together into hopefully a good query, like where is the best pizzeria in Rome, right? That I think, um, I think would solve the the question or, or the issue that that they're having here yeah that's really cool it's like uh you you can basically insert an llm at multiple steps during the rag pipeline to help you optimize both and this is not necessarily what you just talked about but putting 
like deciding which data to put into a vector database and then obviously structuring the queries to pull data out of it. I think that's a, a really cool notion. Hmm. Uh, okay, Spurthy, thank you for that question. Uh, Joey Wong is next. So Joey has a question about uh, working with unstructured PDF files that are in different languages, uh, RTL and LTR. I'm not actually familiar with those in different layouts. And so specifically, he says he's processing books. So when he says various languages, I think he he mean like that means PDF, like the languages behind the PDF, not uh, different human languages. Um, are there some general tips in processing such PDF files? So unstructured PDF files in various languages. Yeah. Um, so good question. So uh, so the RTL and LTR, I, I assume, is right to left, left to right. So obviously, like, think Arabic. Uh, nice. Right to left, right to left. <laughs> and English, left to right. Um, so I assume that is what those are. Um, and yes, I think it gets more difficult. I mean, everything in AI gets more difficult as soon as you go out of English. Um, although I, 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 I understand China, like Chinese has... Mandarin um, has a ton of really good models as well. So maybe you know anything outside of Mandarin and English, you're you're going to have a, a harder time, unfortunately. But there are a lot of multilingual models out there. You just need to think about okay, um, okay, traditional parsing methods are they going to work well with other languages? I think it really depends on the PDF and the language, right? Um, some of them are going to be better supported than others. And also which library you're using. So I think that's more a case of just testing different libraries and methods and seeing which one tends to work well. Uh, the other thing that you can do, of course, is OCR, as long as you're looking at like multilingual OCR. And also, you know, LM, sorry, the multimodal LMs or just computer vision models in generally, general, uh, more and more of them are multimodal um, or trained for a specific language. So Although it's probably not going to do as well as English, there are models out there that support different languages um, and should be able to help you out. You just need to make sure you're choosing, you know, you're, you're using those other language models at all of the right points. Right? So for example, with the semantic chunking part, make sure that with the embedding model, make sure it understands the language that you're trying to embed, otherwise you're not going to get good chunks. Um, so yeah, it's just finding the right models to use in each you know, each part of your pipeline there. Okay, great. And um, yeah, Eli he said he definitely means human languages. Sorry, I, I was mistaken. So yeah, right to left, left to right. Yes, that is in reference to human languages. So thank you for that clarification. And James, you knew it. So uh, yeah, I'll uh, just move on from that. Uh, okay, Stephen Watkins has a fantastic question, something that I have come across with companies that I've been consulting for. Um, so when you extract PDF data like tables and images and build your chunks, basically what he's asking is, how can we tell the vector database, how can we tell our RAG pipeline where in the document that that table or that image belongs? So for example, a table is from page nine, section A, which is paired with this other textual information. Uh, essentially, when chatting with the results, can I accurately get a page number of the table cited? And I suspect not only can you get a page number, but you can actually get even more granular than that. So, James, what do you think? Yeah, no, page numbers for sure you can do. Um, I, I, I'm... Unstructured, I am relatively sure support page numbers, although I could be wrong. There's definitely other PDF libraries that do if they don't, but I, I'm pretty sure Unstructured do. Uh, so you, you can get your page numbers. And of course, at, at some point, you're probably also going to see tables or um, paragraphs that actually span different pages. So you're going to get like, okay, page nine to 10, for example. Uh, so you have to handle that as well. But yes, you can usually extract page numbers uh, and then with the like sections 
Um, again, that's like the okay unstructured where you have your elements and you have like titles, headers, all this sort of stuff. So you want to be kind of like looping through those, saying, okay, this is the most recent header, and either attaching that to the metadata of the chunks you're creating, or actually just prefixing it directly. Generally, I would say attach it to the metadata and then do like the combination of all that before you're embedding a little later on. So you have flexibility in modifying or, or keeping that data separate if you want to. Uh, but yeah, with unstructured, and I, I think many other libraries, you can do that. Uh, you just need to be considering the those elements and, and everything in there. And and James, uh, in, in chat, Rob Wilkinson said, uh, to build on this question, he's basically describing a way to capture box coordinates. So being able to highlight specific areas on a PDF. I've mm. I've seen this done. Um, I, I think just in passing, so I don't know exactly how it was done. But do you do you have any thoughts on that or how it can be done? Yeah. Um. So, how exactly they get the the bounding box? I think it's just a computer vision model, or that could be wrong. Uh, but there are like layout models, like models that literally look at PDFs and like, okay, this is the layout of your of your model, and they give you coordinates in that PDF for the bounding boxes that you would have seen. Um. Oh, okay. So for highlighting source material, material. So I, I assume that is like, okay, um, this is a response. I click on this link, and then it opens a PDF with that section highlighted. I assume that is what you what you're wanting to do there. And I think generally that's more of a it's just like a soft, like it's more of a logical issue, right? I, it's completely doable. I've seen it done before. Uh, you just kind of have to build out that pipeline. And again, if you are doing that, you're going to be dealing with PDFs, which are um, just, you know, the, the worst uh, file format to write code with in, in the world. But, you know, if you, if you need to build it, you need to build it. So good luck. And uh, James, we have about three minutes left. I want to make sure uh, we get to at least one. Hopefully we can get to two. But here's from Dante Perez-Mendez. If you want to, and, and this is almost an extension of the, the question or two prior to this. So if you want to annotate RAG responses with citations on source documents, what is the best approach in terms of chunking and metadata? So again, just an extension of what we've been talking about. Uh, I'm just trying to find that in here. Sorry, who, who is it from? Dante, D-A-N-T-E. So, uh, Oh, yeah, basically okay. asking, how do you chunk and how do you think about metadata if you want to offer citations in the responses? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so the way that I would usually do it, uh, okay, wherever you're storing your documents, you have document IDs. So you're storing your document IDs somewhere, probably in the citation. It depends on how you're going to structure the citation. I, I don't know what the... What, your sort of application looks like or what you want to display. Uh, but generally, okay, page number is probably a useful thing to display there or, or um, at least store in your metadata so that you can open the PDF on the right page. Um, you probably want the title just so the user knows what they're clicking on if they're clicking through to it. And potentially you might want to have like a cleaned up version of your chunk because a, a lot of the time, I would say when you're creating these chunks, they're not always super clean and, and nice to look at, at least for like us humans. LLMs can usually deal with like the kind of messiness that you get quite nicely, um, but we usually don't like it. So you might want to have like a, an a LLM process version of all of your chunks that you display to users. Uh, it depends on what you're wanting to build, but yeah, page number, title, yeah, they're, they're usually pretty essential. Um, but again, it just depends on what you want to show there. All right. Since we're at time, let me just uh, answer two more two more questions. Um, these are easy ones. Uh, are you going to share the Google Collabs? Yes, we will. I think they get sent out in an email after this. And is that also going to be accompanied by a recording of today's video? There will be a recording on the Pinecone YouTube channel, which will go relatively soon. Okay. Uh, and then if it, there were a lot of questions that came in at the last few minutes and if uh, people still have them, what's the best way to get those questions answered after the end of this live stream? So we usually collect 
all of the questions um, from these live live streams from these webinars. So we'll collect all of those and we'll get through to, I think we have all of your emails or at least your contact details for everyone that is in the webinar. So we'll be able to like publish those or, or send them directly to you after. Awesome. Uh, James, I would thank you. Thank you for, for all this great information. Oh, thank you, Matt. It's great. Thanks for everybody who joined as well. This was awesome. Thanks, everyone. Bye.